Anyway, it's wonderful to be here. Val and I are so excited to be here again. Uh, it was a year ago, roughly, that we were here last, and you've grown. You've grown. There's people here we don't know, probably never seen before, and welcome. Good to see you. Excited to be part of what's going on here and just to be able to come in and, and share and chat with you and hear your hearts. God is doing something. You know, there was a real sense of his presence this morning. Both Val and I were in the back there just kind of taking it in and, wow, it was impact. And I needed that. Just felt the presence of God. I want to encourage you like Luke did, that if that's the first time you've experienced that, there's more of that for you. And not just here at church. God wants you to experience that every day. He wants you to know him and sense his presence. So greetings from LifeLinks International, as I said. Um, as Luke said, we, we, Val and I have the privilege of being uh, team leaders of, of the network, and we're just so pleased to be able to come and visit here. And greetings from Forerunner Church. That's, that's our church back at home in Calgary. How many people know where Calgary, Alberta is? Yeah, a few of you do. There you go. Well, it's a great city. We love it. And um, we had the Olympics there in 1988, so that's something we hold on to. Anyway, <laughs> got to hold on to something, right? Anyway, it's great to be here this morning. I want to talk about something that uh, I really feel is important. I, I, as the year started, 2023, I felt like God wanted to bring breakthrough in our lives. You know, and I think he does all the time, right? I mean, he always wants us to have breakthrough, but I, I really felt like there is a gracing for us in this year to see things that maybe we believe for for a long time to finally come to pass. Uh, things we've been holding on to maybe believing for for years and wondering if God was going to come through. And maybe things like it was said earlier that we've let go of, that we've even said, that'll never happen. That's not God. And I'm going to just let that go now and be disappointed. And I feel like today God wants to stir us. He wants to enliven us in some areas. There's some dormant areas in your life. There's some things you've let go of. And he's just saying, today, I want you to pick them up again. I want you to believe me again for breakthrough and not just kind of accept where you're at. That's what I'm sensing. Maybe it's a, like a promise of financial breakthrough in your life. And it hasn't happened yet. And you're doing your best. You're trying. You're being faithful. And like, God, we haven't seen this happen or restored health. Lord, I still have that issue in my life. Or relational restoration, that relationship with somebody, or a prodigal returning home. You're like, we want that son or daughter to come back to Jesus. When are they going to come? God's saying, hang in there. Don't give up now. Or the promise of a fulfilled calling or ministry or something you're believing God to do in your life. I think God wants to stir you again. And, you know, the example I want to give you today is from a man named Abraham in the Bible. And he's called the father of faith. And he really is. He's, he's actually uh, considered the father of uh, the Jewish religion, the Christianity, and even the Muslims. Like Abraham is a significant person in history. There's no question he existed. And there's no question that he has had a great impact. But here's the thing from his life. Uh, at 75, the Lord told Abraham to leave his homeland and go to another country, Canaan. And God was going to give it to him as an inheritance. God told him that that he was going to have descendants like the stars in the sky. Amazing promise. Now, the thing is, he was already 75, and his beautiful wife was already 64. Now, if he's going to have descendants, it means he has to have a child, right? So he hasn't have a child yet, but God comes to him even at a later age and says, you're going to have a child, and it's going to be uh, special what I'm going to do with you and Sarah. Well, that sounds great, right? Except the only thing is God came to him when he was 75, and it isn't until he's 99, like almost 25 years later, and his wife's nearly 90, that the Lord comes to him and promises that they'll have a child within the year. Now, I don't know about you, but is God into making things harder or what? Like when, when, when he's 75 and his wife's 64, I think there's already a challenge there. I think it's already a bit of a challenge. But now he's 99. And, you know, in between, if you, if you know the story, uh, he actually you know, tried to have a child in another way with another person and uh, with his maidservant. And, and, and it's hard for us to fathom that. That's a different culture. But he, he, he figures he's going to help God out. Anybody here ever tried to help God out with the plans in your life? How did that work out for you? Not very well. And so Abraham found that out too. Like, you know, probably should wait for God. But it was hard for him because he's thinking, 
Things, I'm not getting younger. But here, here's the amazing response that Abraham had. It says in Romans 4, as is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Isn't that amazing? Life to the dead and calls into being things that don't exist. Look at verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, you, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, Look at this. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he's about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. Now, this is, there's a mouthful there, but this is amazing because what it says is that even though things got more difficult and more challenging and more impossible for Abraham, somehow he was able to face reality. He was able to look in the eye the truth and yet believe God was greater. Isn't that a key for all of us? See, somehow we need to be able to face the reality of our life, square on whatever it is, however difficult it is, and yet still believe that God is able to do what he promised. This is the secret right here because God wants us to be able to do that. Now, where we get into trouble is two ways. One is when we don't face reality, when we ignore the truth. And the other is when we face the truth and we give up about what God said. We say, well, based on the reality of my life, it's impossible, so I give up on God's promise or I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna ignore reality and believe for God's promises. You have to do both. You have to do both. You have to face the facts and then believe for God to do what he's going to do. That's really important for us. Look what it says in the message. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence and say, it's hopeless. This 100-year-old body could never father a child, nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise, asking cautiously skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God, sure that God would make good on what he had said. Wow, I love the way it says that. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise. He was like, okay, this looks impossible, but I'm still gonna believe because God is able. Now, there's two words for promise. One is, in, in the Greek, one is a promise that's dependent on your and my behavior. You know, I will do this if you do this. The other is an unconditional promise based on God's goodness and what he said to you. This promise to Abraham is that one. God didn't make a promise to Abraham that he was going to make him a father of many nations because Abraham was great. Abraham loved God and, and he believed God and God, God was blessed by that. But God chose to bless Abraham. God chose to say, I'm going to do this in Abraham's life. And it's not based on how good Abraham is. It's because of my goodness. Do you know what? That's the same for you and me. God has promises for you today, not because you're so good and not because you can earn it and deserve it. It's because of grace. It's because he says, I love you and I want to bless you. And so all you need to do, listen, the only thing you and I need to do to, to, to have that blessing is just to believe him. Hey, just to believe him. And some of you, that's the struggle today. You say, you don't know my life. I struggle to believe anymore in this area because I've been disappointed so many times. I feel like the Lord says, I understand that. Abraham understood that. But God comes to you again in some areas. He wants to come to you again today and say, I want you to believe me again because I'm still at work. The story isn't done. It hasn't been written yet. Amen? I want you to believe me again. So I want to give you quickly four, four keys to doing this, all right? Four keys, simple things, not complicated. But hopefully you'll walk out of here with a bit of a roadmap, a bit of a sense of what to do next. The first is this, face reality, face reality. We can't live in denial. We can't ignore reality. Let me give you a goofy story that illustrates this in my life. You know, something I find being a preacher, being a minister, people love it when you tell stories that make you look stupid. Anybody ever? Luke, do you notice that? Yeah. Well, I know, right? We got good material. 
But you tell people, oh, I love it when they, anyway, this one does make me look stupid. So when I was, when I was 17, um, I was on fire for God. I was a camp counselor and uh, I was working with 12 year olds. So, you know, five years younger, I mean, today, five years younger than me, I mean, we're all peers, but, you know, when 12 and 17, compared to them, I thought I was a spiritual giant. <laughs> I mean, I knew the word, right? I was well-versed and experienced. So I wanted to teach them what faith was all about. And I was kind of into some teachings at the time, which were a bit out there, I would say, not, not quite accurate. So I, I want to teach them what faith is all about. So I believed that faith was to deny so in other words, if I had a cold and my nose was running and I had to blow my nose, I didn't have a cold though. They were lying symptoms. They weren't really real. I didn't have a cold. And so I was trying to teach my young students this amazing truth that, if, that, that faith was that they would ignore the reality of how they were. So one guy was sick in our, in our cabin and, and I said to him, you're not sick. And he looked at me, the 17-year-old, and was like, yeah, I'm sick. Like got to blow my nose. I'm sick. No, you're not sick. I, I, I was a little deluded, I think. But I, 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 really, I really believe that if you ignored reality, that somehow that was faith. Like, ignore that. That's not really happening. You're not sick. You're healthy. Even though you're sick, but you're healthy. Somehow that was going to make it work. So anyway, I, I was teaching him my deep wisdom. And then on, on the Thursday night, you know, every week we'd have this open air camp out, or we tried to. And every week it rained. Every week it rained. I never did get one of those in, ever, in those five weeks. But this one week we thought we were going to get it in. So we all headed out, and, and the, 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 the girls were on one hill, and the boys were on the other hill, and there was like a no man's land in between, and they rolled the plastic out, you know? And then they were rolling out the sleeping bags, and it looked perfect. And all of a sudden, it was like a demonic attack. As soon as we set everything up, these clouds came rolling in. <laughs> Seriously, it felt like that, like, we rebuke you, you know. Anyway, they came, and as we were, you know, setting up, we were just ready to go. All of a sudden, I felt rain starting to fall, you know, and you could hear the little pitter-patter on the plastic. And one of my disciples, who had been listening to everything I'd been teaching him, as the rain started falling, he yelled out, it's not raining. <laughs> And as I stood there with rain falling on me, my theology broke. <laughs> Suddenly thought, it is raining. <laughs> Even if I say it's not, it is. I can't ignore the fact that it's raining. This 12-year-old just taught me a lesson. And I since have realized that the truth is we face reality, but we look to a higher reality, which is God. And looking to him for healing or looking to him to come and work in our lives doesn't mean we ignore the way it is now. Abraham didn't say, you know, I'm 30, I can have a kid. He, he realized, I'm old. He faced the facts that he was older, but he believed that God somehow could do it. Do you understand the difference? That's the first key is facing reality. We need to do a denial check and not talking about a river. I'm talking about your life, a denial check. What, where are in your life or in my life, are we ignoring reality? Where are we not facing something? You know, that's where addictive behavior often comes from. We're, we're not facing something, but we're, we're salving ourselves so we don't have to face something. I don't want to deal with that in the past. I don't want to look at that. So I'm going to do this, or I'm going to keep myself busy, or I'm going to be diverted so I don't have to face reality. And the reality is God says, I need you to face that. I remember in, in the 1990s, uh, I was, you know, around my early 30s and mid-90s. Th mid and, and we had, um, to be honest, I'd never been good with money. We, we got married and we made money, obviously, but we just never budgeted. And it was always, ah, just, I look at it now, I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking, but we just didn't. And, and there was a problem for me. And the problem was, I was actually afraid. I was actually fearful to make wrong decisions in the area, so I didn't make decisions. Anybody ever done this before? You know, you're, you're, you're hesitant to really grab hold, so you don't. You just are passive because you don't want to face it. And, and so we weren't doing well financially. We didn't have a lot of money. It was stressful for my wife. And finally, one day, I felt the Holy Spirit really speak to me. He says, Ian, I need you to take 
control the finances. Like, in other words, in concert with my wife. But I need you to lead and I need you to take responsibility and make decisions and not be so passive. And I was like, okay, I, I heard him clearly. So I did. I went to Val. She remembers this vividly. And I went to her and I said, you know, God's spoken to me. And I know we're in a tough time, but God says, I need to grab a hold and take responsibility. And I did. And you know what? God was gracious to me. And something broke. There was a fear. There was a hesitation that broke. And we, we began budgeting. And we budgeted to this day and different systems. And I mean, obviously, a way better place to live, right? But I, the reason was I wouldn't face reality. And someone here, you might be in a financial situation where you're struggling and you want to believe God for breakthrough. But maybe God says to you, the first step is I need you to face it. I need you to face how difficult it is. You need to grab a hold of it. You need to get some help. Get some people to help you with budgeting. Get some people to look at your finances and say, I'm going to face this. God wants to bless me. And the bucket, the holes in my bucket are, there's holes in my bucket and I'm not able because of some of my behavior. God, help me. Maybe somebody, I, I, I've spoken this before and I've had people come up to you and say, God spoke to me today and told me I need to grab a hold of my finances. I need to face reality. So I had to do that. First thing is you've got to, face reality. And then there's an aspect of facing reality where there's a radical acceptance. And what I mean by that is you, you process to the point where you're like, God, I accept where I am right now. Like, I believe there's a better future, but I'm no longer going to run from where I'm at right now. And, and again, that can deal with your past, things that have happened, hurts that you've had. You know, one of the things I would say to you is if if you're in a, a situation where you've never dealt with some things in your past and there's hurts and wounds that are affecting you, can I encourage you with something? Find some people that you trust, that love you, and say, can we get together? Can I get together with you? I want to talk to you. Somebody spiritually mature, somebody who can walk with you and say, I need to share some things with you. I need to go on a journey. Would you help me? Because I got some things I've never even talked about. I got some things I've never looked at, and I don't want to look at them. And God says, listen, I need you to face reality. I need you to look, but I'll be with you when you look. Because I want to heal you. I don't want this to eat you up anymore. I don't want this pain and this bitterness and this unforgiveness and this hurt that eats you up. I don't want it to eat you up anymore. I want to lance it from your life so you can be free to be who I called you to be. And God says, part of that facing reality is, Maybe finding that person. Maybe talk to your leaders. But talk to someone you're in a home group with, a, a, a house group. Find somebody and say, I need to do this. And I've not talked about it. And I keep carrying it around. It's like this backpack full of weights. And God says, I want to take that off of you. Somebody needs to hear this today. Listen, God loves you. And it may be painful to face it. But God says, I'll be there holding your hands. And I'll help you face it because I want you free. I want you free. The the thing when we face the facts, the other thing we need to do, we face the facts of where we're at, but then we focus on what we can control, all right? Now, let's just be really practical here for a minute. Abraham got a word from God at 99 that he was going to have a child within a year. What could Abraham control about that word? What could Abraham do to live out that word. Come on, people. <laughs> he needed to go home and make love to his wife, right? Like he needed he did it by faith to say, I'm going to do what I can do to fulfill this promise. <laughs> and the men are going, amen, brother, preach it. <laughs> we need to do what's in our control to do. Face reality. <laughs> I love the realness of this church. Very real church. Face reality. And then step forward. Okay. Face reality. Secondly, be insistent. The next few will go quickly. Be insistent. This is a picture where God gives us something and we say, I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to give up. It's like Luke 11 when it talks about prayer. Jesus gave an analogy. He talked about a friend... uh, a man who had a friend come in the middle of the night and, and his friend needed food, needed, needed bread. And so he didn't have it. So, so the, the person whose house it was, he went to his neighbor, you know, in the middle of the night, knocked on the door. 
and said, uh, hey, hello, hey, I need some bread. Can you give me some bread? Now, how many, when you look at these, how many of you th- apply this to your life? You know, what, what if someone from your church came over at 2 a.m. to your house asking for bread? How would you feel? Some of you, I'd love it. I'd be there. God bless you, brother. Plan ahead next time, maybe. But, but we wouldn't, right? It'd be inconvenient. In those days, they all slept in the same area. So they were all on the ground sleeping. So the guy knocks on the door and he says, hey, can I get some bread? And the guy inside is like, shh, shh, quiet with my family. Shh, you're going to wake the whole house up. Go away. Come back in the morning. Leave me alone. The guy goes, no, no, you don't understand. I need bread now. I need bread now. You know what the Bible says in Luke 11? Jesus gives this. He goes, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship... At that point, the friendship might be on shallow, on thin ice, right? He's no longer my friend. Yet because of your shameless audacity, it says, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So Jesus said, I, ask, I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. I love this. Because of his shameless audacity, It means courage or confidence of a kind that other people find shocking or rude. Wow. And and Jesus is saying, I want you to be that insistent with me in prayer. I want you to be like almost shocking and rude about how you hold on to what I've I've told you I would do. It's called importunity in the old, in the King James, importunity, in the prayer of importunity, persistence. I remember Val and I, um, you know, we, we had a really tough go in the, again, the 90s. And we'd been given prophetic words saying that we were going to be doing the things we're doing right now. We'd be leading a church, that God had more for us. But I was so far away, and Val was so far away from that. And we were in tough financial times. We were in just really hard place. And you know what I did? I had a tape. Some of you younger generation, what's a tape? What's a cassette tape? <laughs> I had a cassette tape with this prophetic word, and I played that thing on my car stereo like all the time. And I knew it by heart, and I was reminding myself what God had promised us and that we were going to get through the school of faith, that we'd be graduates, that we would do what God called us to do, that he was going to stretch us and develop us, but at the end, we were going to be where God called us to be. And I listened to that. I listened to that. I held on to it. I prayed that. And I think that was the moment where God was strengthening our resolve. Can I encourage you with something? That promise you've been given, that prophetic word, that sense that God has given you, I want to encourage you something. Hold on to that. And, and, and not passively. You know, listen to that on your iPhone, MP3. Listen to that. Process that. Pray that. Because God, God wants to do that in your life. Thirdly, so face reality. Be insistent. And the third thing is strengthen yourself. Isaiah 35 says this. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come to save you. Now, strengthen. So sometimes we get in a place, and I know I get there myself, where we just, we feel weak. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> We, we feel weak, we feel feeble, we feel like letting our hands hang down, just like, I give up. That's what it's talking about. I, I, I just give up. I'm, I'm done. I can't, I can't, I can't, I believe for this anymore. I, I can't keep going. And God says, strengthen the feeble hands and the weak knees. I want you to stir yourself. I love the picture of David, who eventually became king in the Old Testament. It, it's a really tough story if you read it. He was out with his men. This is like days before he became the king. He was out with his men, and they were raiding other areas. You'd have to read the story. But while they were out of their city, the enemy came and raided Ziklag and burned the city to the ground, took their wives and children captive. Terrible story, very tough. And they come back, and all they see is this raised city, and their families are gone. Everything's gone. And the men were pretty upset. I I could picture... (laughs) They'd be pretty, pretty upset. And I don't know how it goes, but 
over here, but sometimes when things don't go well, they turn to the leader, right? It's his fault. It's her fault. So they said, and David was the leader, and they said, we're going to kill you. We're going to stone you. We're so upset. And David was obviously distressed by this. And here's what it says. It said, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I love that. He strengthened himself. I wonder, I ever just ponder these passages and think, what did David do to strengthen himself? You ever, you ever thought about it? Maybe, maybe what he did was maybe he reminded of himself of the time when Samuel came and poured the oil on his head and anointed him to be king. Remember he said, David, David, remember? Like right now, this is pretty dark, pretty grim. But remember, God came, or Samuel came and he anointed you. That means you're gonna be king. That means God has a plan for you. Or maybe he remembered Goliath being struck down. David, remember? Remember that stone and the sling? And remember that big giant? And, and you should have been killed by that giant, but God was with you and that giant fell. He's reminding himself. Maybe he was reminding himself of everything God had brought him through this far. Do you ever find that you have a short memory when it comes to God's goodness? Anybody ever like me? God's great one day. It's like, God, oh, this is the greatest day in the world. God is providing everything. The next day, there's some difficulty. Where are you, God? Where are you? He says, I'm the same God that helped you yesterday. I'll help you today. I'll help you tomorrow. Sometimes we need to stop and remind ourselves of everything God has brought us through because he won't abandon you now. What has he brought us through? And we need to strengthen ourselves. You know, sometimes I'll do this in the mirror. I'll go into the, the washroom and I'll, I'll look in the mirror at a particularly tough time and I'll say, Ian, come on. God is able. Look what he's done in the past. He's going to do it now. Come on. And I stir myself because otherwise I can walk in unbelief and doubt and fear. I need to challenge myself like David did. Come on. Come on, soul. Rise up within me. Come on. God is faithful. He's going to come through. He's not done with you. This isn't impossible for him. Some of you need to hear this today. Some of you need to hear this today. God wants you to know he's not done with you. He's been faithful. He will be faithful. The last thing is we need to remain expectant. That's E. We need to remain expectant. Hebrews 11 says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Confident that God's going to do what he promised. I love the story of the prodigal son. There's many parts I love, but one, one of the things I do really appreciate is if you read that story in Luke 15, um, the son, of course, you know, asks his father for his inheritance. His father gives him his inheritance and the son goes out and he squanders it all. He uh, riots his living. He wastes it and has nothing left. And he's in a pig pen when he finally comes to his senses and says, you know what? If I, if I went home, I'd have three square meals a day and I could be a servant in my father's house, and I'd have shelter. Here I am in a pig pen. I have nothing else. I'm going to go home and be a servant to my father. And it seems reasonable enough, right? I, I can never expect to be a son anymore, but I can go home and be a servant. Well, the exciting thing to me is Luke 15 says this. So he got up and he went to his father. Now listen to this. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him while he was still a long way off. He, here's what I, I like about that. While he was still a long way off means that his father was constantly looking for him and expecting he'd return. I could see his father every day going out and standing in front, you know, down the lane from the farm, as it were, and scanning the horizon. Do I see a cloud of dust? Is there someone coming? Do I see my son with his unique walk? Is he coming home he, every day? Oh, he's not here today. The next day, come out again. Is my son. And then finally, one day, one day, he goes out, he's scanning, and he, he sees this puff of, of dust in the background, and he sees this figure coming, and he goes, is that my son? I think that's my son's walk. I think that's the way he walks. That's my son. And then he runs to his son. 
It's a powerful picture. And there's so many things we could talk about. But here's what I want to say to you. What I like is that he remained expectant. He was looking. He saw his son when he was a long way off. Listen to me. You that have children that are struggling with their faith in God. My wife and I, in our family, we have some some children that are struggling right now. But you know what? We're looking and watching for the signs that they're returning. We're looking. We're watching. We're, We're praying. We're saying, God, would you touch their hearts? Would you stir them? And then we're looking to see. And when we see it, we go, there it is. There it is. God is moving. Can I encourage you with something? God wants you to remain expectant in those areas. And maybe you've stopped looking. Maybe there's some things he's promised you and you're not, you aren't even looking anymore. You're not even, you know, as it were, surveying the landscape to see if an answer might be coming. You know what God wants you to do? He says, I want you to go and start looking again. Yeah, yeah but I've been so disappointed, Ian. Like, I've been so disappointed. Yeah, but God is faithful. And maybe through your disappointment and your delay, God is doing something in you that's preparing you for what he wants to do in your life. Maybe God is using this. So stop pouting. Stop just turning away and say, God, I'm going to start believing and expecting again. There are some people here God is really stirring today. Because God wants you to rise up. He wants you to push through this, this weight that's been down on you, this oppression of the enemy and he wants you to begin to believe again he wants you to rise up because there's something for you so i want to close right now four things face reality you got to face reality but jesus will be there when you face reality he'll help you you need to be insistent with god's promises what's he promised you he wants you to be audacious about it he wants you to hold it up and say god you promised me this And I'm not letting go, God. I'm not going to let go. In fact, if I'm not going to see it, I'm going to go down holding on to it. That's the picture. Strengthen yourself. Some of you need to go look in the mirror and stir yourself about what God has done in the past and then remain expectant. God, give me an expectancy again. Help me to scan the horizon again to see you come. Would you stand with me right now? I want to pray with you this morning. Can we just close our eyes for a minute? And uh, let's, just, let's just close our eyes for a minute. What I like to do at home is just have us pause, take a breath, and ask God what He's saying to us today. You know, in any message, there's a lot that's said. But what is it that impacts you today? What is the truth He's speaking to you today what of those points particularly resonated in your heart today because if whatever that is that's where the grace is right now for you God says I want you to leave here with that one or two things and I will give you strength to see change in your life Mm. you know Val just sensed that there was, a, there was a married couple here that was in a real tough spot. And this speaks to them today because the Lord doesn't want them to give up on their relationship. Doesn't want them to give up on the promises he's given them. God is still able to make it work for you. It's difficult, but if you face reality, he's gonna help you. He's gonna give you a way to see it mended see your relationship restored. It's going to bring healing where maybe there's never been. God says, don't give up. Be insistent about your marriage because I'm, I'm going to come. But you need to face the reality. You need to get, get some help. You need to get some people you can be real with. Tell them what's going on. Let them speak into your life. But God says, when you do that, I'm going to help you. I'm going to meet you. If God's spoken to you something this morning, would you just slip your hand up for me? Just put your hand up. Something, something stands out to you today and you're like, I, I want to respond. Yeah. I'm going to pray for you right now.
Father, we thank you for these hands that are lifted up. And Lord, whatever it is you've spoken today, in Jesus' name, Lord, we just pray for grace and strength from the Holy Spirit to take the next step, whatever the next step is. Father, I pray for that breakthrough to come. Lord, I pray that you'd help these people to face reality. Face reality. I pray they could be insistent with what you've promised them and that they could strengthen themselves by remembering what it is you've done in the past. And Lord, I pray that you give them a new expectancy, a new expectancy right now that there is more, that you were coming, that you're gonna move in the name of Jesus right now. I have one more thing I wanna ask you're here and you don't know Jesus you've never given your life to him can I can I be really bold with you you need to face reality you need to face reality because there is a reality without Jesus and it is not a pleasant one without Jesus we are all lost without Jesus we will be punished for our sins without Jesus there is no hope of relationship in this life or the one to come with God That's reality. But here's the good news. If you and I face the reality of our sin and our brokenness before God and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my life. I want to serve you. If we do that, he changes us and we're born again. We become new. We have a new destiny. And when we pass away, not only do we enjoy a relationship with Jesus on this earth, but we will go to a place called heaven and we will be with him forever. That is reality. But today, some of you need to face reality. You need Jesus. He loves you, and he wants you to come to him today. With our head bowed, eyes closed, I just feel to do this. Anybody here just say, you know, I need Jesus today, and I'm bold enough to say it. I need him. I'm going to face reality. I need Jesus today. Put your hand up, please. Let me know. I want to pray with you this morning. Anybody here? I need Jesus. Father, I pray for this church. I thank you for all those that have come to know you. And I pray for many, many more to give their lives to Jesus. Lord, thank you for this church, a beacon of grace in this community. And Lord, that many will be able to face reality because of this place and its people and come to know you. As I close, finally, I'm going to ask if anybody wants prayer today. If you put your hand up and God has stirred you and you say, I want to pray with somebody. One, my next step is I just actually want to talk to someone this morning and I want them to pray with me and I want, to, I want to begin that journey. Would you just come down right now? Just feel free. Come down right now to the front. We're going to pray with you today. Before you leave, thank you so much. I believe there's people ready to pray and just to stand with you. Anybody else today, you need to come down. Just feel free to come down this morning. And we'll pray with you. Lord bless you all. Love you very much. Thanks for the warm welcome. I'm going to turn it over to Luke. Bless you.